as I said, that's the processional hymn for today's Mass. The processional hymn can be found in your pew missile at number 123. Draw us in the spirit's tether. That's number 123.
the minds of the faithful to unite in a single purpose. Grant your people to love what you command and to desire what you promise, that amid the uncertainties of this world, our hearts may be fixed on that place where true gladness is found. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as the Lord, as to the Lord. For the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of the church, he himself the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, 
cleansing her by the bath of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So also, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, I'm sorry. This is the second reading. I read the second reading. I 
am sorry, I read the second reading. This is the first reading. A reading from the book of Joshua. Joshua gathered together all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, summoning their elders, their leaders, their judges, and their officers. When they stood in ranks before God, Joshua addressed all the people. If it does not please you to serve the Lord, decide today whom you will serve. The gods your fathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose country you are now dwelling. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord for the service of other gods. For it was the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt, out of a state of slavery. He performed those great miracles before our very eyes and protected us along our entire journey and among the peoples through whom we passed. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Many of Jesus' disciples who were listening said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, Does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the very beginning the ones who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it be granted by my Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. 
You know, that's our little trick here at St. Anthony's to see if somebody hasn't been here or they're new, if you sit down after, after, the, after, the, after the gospel. <laughs> so how's everybody doing? Good? Excellent. Well, today, as I mentioned, we're continuing with the series on Sacra Sanctum Concilium. And you know, a number of years ago, when I was studying in a seminary in Baltimore, at St. Mary's in Baltimore, I decided one weekend to go to a, a church in downtown Baltimore to attend what is sometimes called the traditional Latin Mass. That's a, the Mass in Latin, how it was celebrated before the Second Vatican Council. Now, we have a Mass at noon that's in Latin, but it's the Mass of today in Latin. But I decided one weekend to go to the Mass as it was celebrated before the Second Vatican Council, and there was a church in downtown Baltimore that celebrated the Mass. And I had heard about it from other seminarians who were kind of interested in, in it, and so I was curious. So one weekend I said, I should go and take a look at this. So I went, and I went to, um, down, into downtown Baltimore. It was really a beautiful church where they had this ma Mass, one of these beautiful old Gothic churches that are kind of like dark wood inside with beautiful artwork and things. Nice place to go and pray during the day. And I was a bit nervous about going to this Mass because I had never been to this Mass before, and I was born after the Second Vatican Council, so I really didn't know what to expect or what you were supposed to do. So when I walked in, I see that up there in the front of the, in the first pews, are a group of young men all dressed in suits and ties and stuff. They looked official, so I said, all right, I'll sit by them. They look like they know what they're doing, and then I'll do whatever they did. So that's what I did. I went in, and I sat next to this group of young men. And then the, the, um, the Mass began with the ringing of the bell, just like we still do today. And the rest of the Mass was almost completely in silence. It was what they call, and what they used to call, and what today they call, a low Mass. Anybody know what I'm talking about? A low Mass. And it's, a low Mass is basically a Mass without much singing or without much ceremony. There were many of the Masses before the Second Vatican Council in the United States that people went to were low Masses. And the priest prayed the prayers of the Mass in a very hushed voice. You really couldn't hear what he was saying. And instead of the people singing or saying parts, the altar boys would say the parts on behalf of the people. So when it was time for the people to say, I confess to Almighty God in Latin, it was the altar boys who would say, not the people. So the altar boys kind of took the, the parts of the people. And the only time really that the people said anything was when the priest turned around and said, Dominus Bobiscum, and everybody responded. Very good, you guys remember. Excellent, very good. Ecum spiritu tu, I'm with your, I'm with your spirit. And that was really about it. And just about everything was in silence. There was no singing, like I said, and there was no real verbal participation of the people. And many of the people, including these young men in front of me, had missiles. And a lot of you may remember having those missiles where it was Latin on one side and English on the other. And they would follow the, the mass in the missal. And they only really looked up. I saw them look up when the bells were rung for the consecration. That's a, you know, a beautiful time of the Mass, and definitely got to look up during that part of the Mass. But the rest of the Mass, most of the, most of the time, the people had their, their face in the book, or they, some of the people were praying the rosary and things like that. And I have to say, you know, it felt to me like there were two completely separate things going on what the priest was doing at the altar and what the people were doing in the congregation. That's not what was going on. That's just the way it felt to me, how it appeared to me. And I have to say, you know, I've loved the Mass since I was a little boy, but it was the first time in my life that I felt completely disconnected from what was happening in the Mass. Now, it was still the Mass, but it didn't give me at all the sense of the awesomeness of what's really happening. It was like someone had taken that, the awesomeness and beauty of the Mass and put a blanket over it. So it was still there, but it was more difficult to see. And I've since been to other pre-Masses in the style of how they did it before the Second Vatican Council. And during these Masses, some of these Masses, they would have beautiful music like Bach or Mozart or things. And it's incredibly beautiful. I love that kind of music. But still, in listening to that, it didn't, I still felt disconnected in a way like I was listening to a beautiful concert and watching something going on that I really wasn't a part of. Well, that was the beginning, going to that low mass in Baltimore, really was the first time I realized for myself 
Why the council had urgently called for the reform and the renewal of the mass? Why things needed to change? They rightly realized that there was a, something happening in the world. And what was happening in the world, this was soon after the Second World War, was the rise of atheism, modernism, and all sort, and uh, you know, we see it in communism, they, they just experienced the Nazis and things, all sorts of things contrary to God, a real attack on God and human nature and what it means to be a child of God and what it means to be a person. And they saw all these errors spreading throughout the world. The Second World War didn't get rid of them. Communist, communism came right up out of that time period, Soviet communism and, and an extreme socialism. And so the, the church fathers, the bishops of the church throughout the world saw this going on, and they said basically that the people of God need a revival. They need a revival to come back to the faith, to connect to the faith in a deeper and more personal way, a revival of faith and true devotion, to be able to confront these powerful errors that were being spread throughout the world and wreaking havoc. And so they said that if that revival is going to happen, it needs to begin with the Mass. It needs to begin with the heart of the Church and the heart of the Christian Christianity, which is the Mass. That the Mass needed to reflect better what it really is and what it always has been. That it needs to allow the people to enter into the Mass, not just by observing or by hearing, but with their whole self, with their whole heart and mind and soul and strength to enable us to give our whole selves to God the Father with the Son at the Mass. So how did the Council Fathers, what did they say could help to achieve that goal? Well, one of the main tools that they thought could help achieve this goal was a return to the increased use of the vernacular language, the language of the people. Like we talked about in weeks prior, in the very beginning, it was done in the language of the people, which was Greek and, and Hebrew and stuff. So the language of the people was spoken during the Mass of the early Christians. And then later, it became Latin as the language changed, so the common people to Latin, and then it kind of stayed in Latin for a long time. So they called for return to the vernacular, more use of the vernacular in the Mass. Now, to be specific, the Church Fathers said that Latin must be preserved, that it is to be preserved, that we're not to throw it out. Some people think at, at the Second Vatican Council, the, the bishops and the church fathers said, get rid of Latin, we don't need it anymore. That didn't happen. In fact, they said Latin is to be re preserved. But they said that things like the readings, the directives, some of the prayers, the chants, and especially the people's parts should be done in the language that the people speak. All the parts that are appropriate to them. And the council left it to the bishops and the bishops' conference to decide what other things they might want to have in the vernacular, in the language of the people, English, Spanish, Italian, whatever language you speak. So there's two important things to remember from this document, Sacrosanctum Concilium. First, that Latin is not supposed to disappear from the life of the church. And yet at the same time, there's supposed to be a more generous offering of the language of the people. Well, in addition to language, the Church Fathers also called for a simplification of the actions of the, of the priests during the Mass and the lim elimination of unnecessary repetitive actions. And this was to make those actions more easily understood because there were a lot of things that over the years just got added and added and added onto it. And you know, sometimes pe some people can have this idea that if there's something worth doing, that it's worth overdoing, right? So, for instance, if something is good to do once, why not do it 50 times, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and so that kind of happened in the liturgy. And so the church fathers said that those things should be simplified and the, and the unnecessary repetition should be done away with. So, for instance, when you'll notice during the Mass, when we bless the bread and the wine, you see the priest makes a big sign of the cross over the bread and wine. Prior to the Second Vatican Council, that was done five times. And if you see a priest celebrate this way, very often you see it like this. <laughs> and what is better, doing it five times like that or doing it once with meaning and reverently? So that's what the church fathers were calling for, that things would be done with more thought and be more easily comprehended by, by everyday people. The council said that the liturgical actions, they shouldn't require a lot of explanation 
that there should be a basic element of all these actions and words that are self-evident to baptize believers. Everything shouldn't be a mystery. And this gets to another important thing, because I hear sometimes people will say, well, the way the Mass was celebrated before the Second Vatican Council, there was more mystery to it. It was more mysterious and so more mystical. And by virtue of that, there's this idea that it was more holy or more sacred. But that's not really a Christian understanding of mystery. Mystery is not hiding things or, or intentionally obscuring, thing, obscuring things from people so that they don't understand it, and so it's a mystery to them. That is not really mystery. That's not a Christian understanding of mystery. A Christian understanding of mystery is that God has revealed himself and poured himself out to us. He wants us to know who he is to invite us into his internal life. And that as we approach him, as we come into his internal life, as he teaches us about himself, as we come to know him and love him more and realize his love for us and experience his mercy, then we're still left with our mouth open in awe of him, at the mystery and wonder of who he is. That's what real Christian mystery is, not kind of like a parlor game of hiding things from people so they don't get it. That is not real mystery. Real mystery is once we're able to comprehend what we're able to comprehend to the best of our ability and with our full participation, that still we're left in awe of him, in awe of his greatness and his goodness and his love, dumbfounded by him and struck in awe. It's realizing that as the closer we get to him, the more other we realize that he is. That is a true Christian sense of mystery. And so the church fathers said, these things should be easily understandable to most people. And the council also said that there were some elements that had been lost through history. So just like things have been added on through history, some things have been discarded through history. And so the church fathers said, take a look at those things from the very beginning of the church's life. Look at those things and see, are there some of those things that got discarded by an accident of history or by changing circumstances that now can be reintroduced in the Mass and would make sense for the people today and be meaningful for them? One of those things is one of the things that I love a great deal that they reintroduce into the Mass, and that is the petitions, the universal prayer. From the very beginning of the church, the people always, after the readings were proclaimed and stuff, they would offer their intentions to God, pray for the poor, the sick, those in need, for an end to war, for all the needs in the hearts of the people. And we do that in a universal prayer at each Mass, right? Well, that had been discarded for centuries. And so the church, the, the experts looked back and they said, look, this is something that could mean something for people today and enrich their experience of the liturgy. And so that was brought back into the mass. Not everything, because not everything will work today, but some things that were appropriate were brought back into the mass. And all this was done to make the mass more accessible to the people in order to facilitate for a very particular reason. Our increased participation in the Mass isn't just so everybody has something to do, so we're not bored. That's not what this is about, to give everybody a job. This is to enable everyone in the liturgy to give their whole self fully through our participation to God, to unite ourselves and our sacrifices and our lives, to allow Christ to take them up with his sacrifice and offer us with himself to the Father and our participation, our singing, our responding to the prayers, our even our actions, what we do in the Mass, all enable that to happen. And so, to make a long story short, I'll give you a little saying that one of the nuns told me when I was a little kid, when I was in fourth grade, I had Sister Kathleen Margaret, one of the Dominican sisters of Caldwell, who I love and owe my faith to them and the Benedictine monks even to this day. They taught me almost everything with my parents and stuff, everything I need to know about the faith. And I can tell you, the most valuable things I learned about the faith, I learned from first to eighth grade from those sisters and the, and the monks and my, and my parents. But... But Sister Kathleen Margaret, who's a beautiful nun, she used to say to us when she'd look out at the class and she'd see that we're all kind of falling asleep and not really paying attention, she would say, stop being a lump on a log. <laughs> and so basically the church, anybody ever hear that expression? Right? I love that expression. Don't be a lump on a log. Well, like Sister Kathleen Margaret said, and all the bishops were trying to tell us, we're not to be lumps on a log in the Mass. 
We're not here to be spectators, to watch a show, to be entertained, none of that. We're here to give ourselves completely. And we do that both in, in singing the hymns, which means that we pick up the books, because none of us, I mean, if you don't have the songs memorized, you've got to pick up the books, and we sing the hymns, sing all the hymns with your full voice. Respond with your full voice, not yelling, but not whispering like it's a secret either. <laughs> you know, say it like you want people to hear it and like you want God to hear it. Respond with your full voice. Respond, we respond with our actions. You know, we sit, stand, and kneel. It's not just a Catholic exercise program. <laughs> Although it is very healthy to do. <clears throat> they, all those actions mean something. When we kneel down, we're kneeling in adoration before our King, our God, our Savior, our Lord. Scripture says, before Jesus and at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the, under the earth will bow down, will kneel before him. So we kneel down in adoration of our God. We stand together at the moments when we stand to bring our voices together as one to pray to God the Father with Christ, through Christ, his Son. We sit to listen attentively, to receive Christ in his word, in both the readings that are proclaimed and in the preaching of the gospel. We participate intellectually. We're not just here to receive. We're here to participate intellectually, to think and to meditate about these mysteries of God that are revealed to us in the sacredness and holiness of this Mass, to meditate on this experience, this awesome experience of God's love for us that we call the Mass. We're to participate intellectually by learning more about the Mass when we're not in the Mass. We're to participate emotionally, giving our hearts, laying our hearts before Jesus so he can take our hearts with his heart and present us to the Father. The Mass calls for all of us and all of our person, not just a little bit of us, not just a piece of us, not just what we have left over, our entire self. It's like Sister, Sister Kathleen Margaret told me, let's not be a lump on a log but give ourselves completely to our God who gives himself completely to us. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and life for the world to come. Amen. Let us present our needs to our Heavenly Father. For the intentions of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, and our Bishop David O'Connell, and for our priests and brothers, we pray to the Lord. Lord. For the men and boys of our parish whom God is calling to be priests and brothers, especially in the Red Bank Oratory of St. Philip Neri, and for the women and girls whom God is calling to be sisters, 
that they have the courage to say yes to him, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Brother Zachary, Brother Anthony, and Brother James, who are in formation for the oratory, and for our diocesan seminarian, Brian, that the Lord give them the grace of joy and perseverance in their vocations. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For husbands and wives and widows and widowers, that they may lead their families to greater holiness and fidelity to Christ and his church. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, the sick, and those in need, that the Lord may inspire in us new ways of serving him in them. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the deceased members of our family and parish, and for those who have no one to pray for them, that our prayers may accompany them as they are prepared for paradise. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the special intention of this Mass, for Brian MacDonald and for Eugene Barry O'Brien, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for peace in the world, especially in the Holy Land, in Ukraine, in Sudan, in Haiti, and all throughout the world with his violence and enmity, that we might come to see one another as brothers and sisters and love each other. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, with faith and trust, we place all of our needs in your loving hands. We ask in your kindness and mercy that you please hear and answer us according to your holy will, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. There is a second election today for the diocesan assessment. The offertory hymn can be found in your pew missile at number 104, Christ has made the sure foundation. That's number 104. And at this time, we invite the children to bring their gifts to the altar.
God, Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all of his holy church. O Lord, who gained for yourself a people by adoption through the one sacrifice offered once for all, be so gracious on us, we pray, the gifts of unity and peace in your church. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by his birth he brought renewal to humanity's fallen state, and by his suffering canceled out our sins. By his rising from the dead, he has opened the way to eternal life. And by ascending to you, O Father, he has unlocked the gates of heaven. And so with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise, as without end we acclaim. gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather people to yourself, except in the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, grace and make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper is ended, he took the chalice. And giving you thanks, he said a blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
Mysterium Fidei. celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with our Holy Father, Saint Philip Neri, with Saint Anthony of Padua, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help, May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope and David our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen, Gracie, to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world, to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life. Give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him. O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. command and formed by divine teaching we dare to say our in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, power, and glory, and glory, and glory. Lord Jesus Christ who said to your apostles peace I leave you my peace I give you look not in our sins but on the faith of your church and grace you grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed to those called to suffer of the Lamb. on page number 236.
found in your pew missile, and number 208. Oh Jesus, we adore thee. That's number 208.
Let us pray. Complete within us, O Lord, we pray, the healing work of your mercy, and grace you perfect and sustain us, so in all things we may please you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I just have two announcements. One, tonight is Youth, Junior, and Children's Oratory at 7 p.m. They're having a barbecue and backwards game. And then also our registration for adults who would like to receive into the church or receive their sacraments or be baptized. Uh, that will be beginning soon. So you can register at the information booth uh, right after the mass or you can call the office during the week. The Lord be with you. And the Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks to God. The recessional hymn can be found in your pew missile in number 192, Love the Vine, All Love's Excelling. That's number 192. Thank you.